Welcome to Euroactive interview series. I'm Karolina Zbytniewska, Editor-in-Chief at Euroactive Poland. Hello. Hello. My guest today is Margrethe Vestager, Executive Vice President of European Commission for a Europe fit for a digital age. Danish and European Iron Lady that cost Apple and Google 20 billion euros so far. Mrs. Commissioner, what are the lessons to take from the coronavirus crisis for the European Union, its member states and European citizens? I think that the main lesson is a very fundamental one, that, uh, that you can only help yourself by helping others. Uh, and also looking forward, uh, we can only recover if we recover together. And, uh, and that goes for everything that we have been dealing with. Um, the sad thing is that it seems very difficult for us to remember. It is as if we have to relearn it uh, every day. But, uh, but we are depending on one another. Uh, and I think this is the most important thing. And it has been such a difficult time for so many people. But the thing that has been heartwarming has been to see how helpful people have been, how many people who have reached out, helped people they didn't know, uh, with walking the dogs, uh, uh, doing the shopping, uh, making sure that necessities were met. Of course, health personnel, but also the many people that we may not recognize on, on a daily basis. Uh, the people in transportation, the people taking uh, the garbage, cleaning the streets, uh, the people sitting uh, in the shops uh, at the, the cashier. Uh, and I hope that the respect of those very fundamental sort of backbone tasks, that we will take the respect for these people with us also to the other side of this crisis. What are the major cracks that the coronavirus uh, has revealed about European integration, about this solidarity that you mentioned? Well, it was extremely painful uh, in, in the first, first weeks of the health crisis to see countries uh, closing borders, uh, having export bans, uh, seeing the queues at borders, uh, trucks in queues of 20, 40 kilometers, trucks with uh, essential uh, things that were needed, um, that, that your neighbors do not help you when you are really, really in need. Um, and I think that is very important to remember that those wounds have not healed. And uh, if we do not find a way of, of building the co recovery together, well, those wounds, they may just, you know, jump right open again. Uh, and that, I, I think that is really important. Uh, also, uh, we have no sort of common competence for real when it comes to health. And, and that delayed us in fighting the virus. Uh, because in the beginning it was every country for itself and, and that delayed uh, the coordination and the common response. Uh, and that, of course, will have to do much, much better the next time. Not only countries were left behind, but millions of people all around Europe and all around the world. Crises tend to work as magnifying glasses and catalysts of processes underway. What, in your view, is the impact that the coronavirus pandemic has had on today's state of globalization, the so-called globalization for zero or the industrial revolution for zero? One of the things that we, uh, I think, discovered in a very painful way was that it's no good just to have a single supplier if that single supplier closes down. Uh, we saw that on, on paracetamol, I'm told that is only basically produced in India. Uh, we saw that very much in, in masks and, and protective equipment, very much produced in, in China. So I think there will be a, a, a movement to move closer to Europe, maybe also into Europe, but also to, to do multi-sourcing in a different way than before. 
uh, also because we saw this tendency already before the crisis because of digital technology, robotics, uh, automatization, moving things back uh, closer to, to headquarters uh, had started as a very slow tendency. And that may accelerate that you say, well, when, when salaries is not that important because you have automated procedures, uh, robotics uh, to do what, what uh, people did before, then why not take it closer to home? and in more different places so that you have more resilience. Uh, and that, of course, changes sort of the phase of globalization because globalization is a process. What it shouldn't change is that we engage with other countries, that we have the approach that we want to work with every country on this planet on all kinds of issues. Um, and, and that I hope, of course, that globalization as a process can change in this manner, but that we will engage even more with other countries to fight climate change, to fight the next or prevent uh, the next pandemic, uh, to find a, a cure and a, and a vaccine for, for the virus uh, that we're suffering from right now. Having just one supplier may be risky in case of trouble. As an alternative approach, some countries have embraced protectionist tendencies that have been reaffirmed all over Europe, from Bulgaria through Czech Republic to France. Maybe it is the way to go to avoid possible disappointments in the future. And uh, sorry for playing the devil's advocate. But there, there are some paradoxes here, because I am, I am you know, a stern believer that it's important that, that we can decide what kind of society we want to be, what kind of market we want to have, because we have, we have our own choices. We have a social market economy, we have universal health care, we have universal access to, to our educational systems. We have made choices in Europe that are special and very, very dear to us. But the paradox is that we have been able to do that because a lot of prosperity comes from dealing with countries outside of the European Union. So actually we need this kind of, and it is a paradox, sort of open autonomy. We are the world's biggest trading bloc. Uh, we are the preferred trading partner for 80 uh, plus countries on the planet. So we will not get very far if we just wanted to, to fence in uh, Europe. Uh, because we still need the rest of the world. But I think we need to be much more assertive about who we are and what we can do ourselves, because Europe has so much to offer that we tend not to see, uh, but that would uh, put us in a stronger position. You yourself are the hero of European assertiveness. But on that note, on the note of European assertiveness, what would you say about the digital services tax? At the moment, there is a problem with finding consensus in Europe, but also with other external partners like uh, the US. For example, Donald Trump perceives taxing tech giants as unfair treatment of US companies. How would you respond to this approach? Well, I, I, I don't think that we can answer that without first and foremost answering to all the many businesses who pay their taxes who work really hard to make a profit and from that profit to pay their taxes. And those are hundreds and thousands and millions of businesses in Europe. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now, of course, when, when states come also to help out in, in the lockdown, then, of course, I hope that they see, oh, it, it actually makes kind of sense that I contribute uh, uh, my taxes here because the society is also here for me uh, when we have a, a lockdown situation. I think it's, it's that unfairness that should be addressed, that it cannot be that most businesses pay their taxes and few businesses do not pay their taxes. And we push all we can for a global consensus because that would be the best. If that cannot be achieved, I think it is very important that Europe pick it up and that we, of course, renew the proposal from, from the last time because everyone gets wiser over time uh, and then push for a European consensus. Uh, because I think that it is important that we answer to all the many businesses who pay their taxes. That's the unfairness 
that we should address. But this is uh, just one part of the problem with the digital services tax. The other part is that for taxing tech giants, we need the consensus that you mentioned on the EU level. There are countries, especially Ireland and the Netherlands, that are not so willing to tax tech giants because they have their European headquarters there, provide jobs and revenue. How to persuade them to be on board? Well, of course, it's, it's never, ever easy uh, with taxation. Never, ever. But, but I have seen before that things you thought was not possible becomes possible. Um, when uh, Denmark had the presidency of, of the European Union back in the spring 2012, uh, I was a minister, I was heading the Eurogroup, uh, the, the ECOFIN. Uh, and here we had a number of tax proposals that we pushed because we found it was important for them to be passed. And a colleague of mine said back then, not going to happen over my dead body. And you know, today, these proposals, they have been passed. Actually, some time ago, they are being real now, and he's still alive and well. So these are two good things at the same time. He's alive and well. We have passed the tax legislation. So, you know, I think it's important to say, of course, we respect different positions, but that is the starting point for a negotiation. That should not be sort of a blank uh, veto. This can never happen. It is now being proposed to use this tax as a new source of EU's revenue, along with the financial transactions tax or a levy on imports of goods produced under lower CO2 emission standard than European. This might be a persuasive argument for these two countries, especially as one of them, the Netherlands, is a member of the so-called Frugal Four. Well, as, as you said, we have, uh, we have invented this new model of, uh, of financing our recovery to say, well, instead of it's a group of member states who lend more, it is the community institutions who can, um, who can lend because we have headroom for this. But since we want to, to uh, give uh, part of that lending for member states as grants, because some member states have a lot of debts and, and, and we're in this situation together. It's not because of someone doing something wrong. It's just because of an awful situation because of the virus. Then it, it, it's not a good thing just to put more debts on, on the debts uh, that some countries have already. And, and then if you give away people that you have lent, of course, you should figure out a way to pay them back. And there are three different ways to do that. Uh, either uh, member states pay more uh, into the next uh, budget, or the next budget will be very much smaller, or we have more own resources uh, to cover that we can pay back uh, the money that we have lent in common. Um, and I think that, that digital uh, taxation and revenue from that uh, is one uh, obvious proposal uh, to do it. And of course, I hope uh, with my colleagues that it will be part of, of also arguing for having digital taxation, that it can be one of the solutions for us actually to use this mechanism for a strong, fast recovery. Uh, because we need a strong and fast recovery also for sort of geopolitical uh, reasons. Uh, after the financial crisis, China and the US, they recovered much faster than Europe. Uh, and that, of course, becomes an issue for us. So we should do our best to recover fast uh, in order not to sort of coming staggering behind the others uh, when, when sort of the agenda uh, for the next years are, are being set uh, for our planet. I'm so sorry for sticking to the digital tax for the fourth question, but this time a short and a final one. You said that we need a wider consensus to go with a digital tax beyond the EU. But what is the time frame? If the OECD does not find a consensus, what would you like, when would you like to have the digital services tax levied among the EU countries? Well, the, the president, uh, our president has been very clear on this, uh, that if, if no OECD consensus, we should table a proposal uh, by the end of this year. 
Uh, I don't know if she will give us all a little bit more time because of, uh, of COVID-19, uh, uh, but we have a quite uh, firm uh, time plan. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the negotiation will start uh, with member states uh, and hopefully also with parliament. You mentioned China and the US in the previous answers. And so I would like to ask you about uh, European champions. Companies in Europe still face the challenge of 27 tax and regulatory systems, 24 different languages. It is a difficult starting point. You are also looking with some suspicion at big mergers. How without really strong and big companies supported by all possible measures, which is possible both in the US and in China, can European firms be really competitive globally? Uh, well, first and foremost, I'm not against big mergers. What I'm against is that a company is unchallenged. Because I think if you're unchallenged, well, why bother with, you know, being as sharp as you can be, as good as you can be, as innovative as you can be with your customers? We've had giant mergers in cement, in beer, in dairy, number of markets. But the trick is here that they are still being challenged. So, you know, we can have really big companies if they still accept to be challenged also in the European market, because that is what keeps you innovative uh, and sharp. The second thing is, because I think you're completely right, the best thing that we can do for European businesses is to make sure that the single market really works. Because that is the main difference between uh, the US, China and Europe that they have a single market with more or less single language and with less administrative barriers. I think they have more than we think of uh, because it's also, you know, many states that are united in the United States and many regions uh, of China uh, that are united uh, to be one China. Uh, so probably it is more difficult both to be Chinese and to be American than we think. But, but I think that is the most important thing we can do, that is to push for a single market that really works. And the last thing that we have done is to set up a task force with member states uh, to deal with a, a mapping of all the barriers uh, that we could find for the single market to work. And then asking the, tax for, the, the task force with member states involved to do away with all these barriers. Um, I think that may be an approach to make this happen, because then what may be sort of a, a sweet little barrier in, in your country, when others then look and they say, oh, come on, take it down, then we will take our little thing down as well. Uh, because actually the single market is, is like having a, you know, a lawn. You have to keep over it all the time because otherwise, you know, weeds come in and all of a sudden there's a tree. So you really have to work on it all the time. That's the best thing that we can do because then businesses can grow. On that, a similar topic from the state aid division. You said that discrepancy in state aid distorts the single market and hampers recovery. But on the other hand, with state aid, countries not only save local companies with often symbolic value, for example, Lufthansa for Germany, but also these companies which now are in trouble will once give jobs and salaries to the people. Yes, indeed. Uh, there are many, many positive things to be said uh, about the state aid uh, that is being handed out right now. Uh, also because um, there are positive side effects. If, uh, if the people supplying you, uh, they can survive uh, because they get aid, of course it is better because then you can continue your own production. So, of course, there's a number of good things to be said about it. The thing is that there are enormous differences in what member states can do. Uh, no member state can do more than what is necessary. But some member states may not even be able to do what is necessary. And then, of course, there is a risk of the single market uh, falling apart, being fragmented. 
Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we have uh, proposed what we call a, a solvency support instrument, so that we Europeans in common, we take part of the risk for private investors to invest in companies, healthy companies, but companies in member states that have been hard hit and may not themselves have the funds to support these companies. Uh, because that can be part of the solution to make sure that when we recover, we recover because of having a strong single market and not only for some businesses in our value chain to be strong because of aid, but for everyone to have a fairer chance of making it. Uh, and here, I think we, as, as a community, as Europeans, we can help out to sort of crowd in private funding by accepting to take part of the risk. And another question concerning public support. What do you think about conditionality of European aid and European funds in general, based on the rule of law, but also on climate responsibility? Well, I think... Uh, both things are, are important, but a bit different. Uh, rule of law is, is the very fundamental, uh, both in itself, uh, as a citizen, that I know that I get the same treatment as anyone else uh, who is taken to court. That in itself is, of course, extremely precious. Uh, but also for our economies, that a business know we can go to court if something happens, if someone do not pay the bills or, or whatever, uh, that we then get a, a fair and equal treatment. So, so rule of law is a, a completely sort of integrated part of our very foundation. Uh, and and I, I strongly believe that that has to be also an integrated part of being a member of the European Union not as a, as a template that everyone will have to do the same, but as a, as a firm commitment of, of an independent uh, juridical system. When it comes to, to green uh, conditions, well, this is for the future. This is what we want to achieve. And, uh, and when we spend together as Europeans, I think we have full legitimacy to say, well, when we spend European funds, then we should also spend to achieve uh, our European strategic goals. Because why, why rebuild the old world when we need a new one? Uh, the risk is, of course, that we would then pay twice. Uh, and this is also why, for instance, this uh, solvency support instrument I just spoke about, also here, uh, we will say, well, well you have to, to plan for uh, how to how to also green your business, how to minimize the use of electricity or, or what it may be that is relevant in, in your line of business. Um, because, because that we can do, then we can make things come together uh, in the lending, in the investment, uh, in the grants that we give. Pushing on this uh, European Green Deal topic, the general but uh, very important question now. How, in your view, can we should we reconcile economic competitiveness of the EU and its member states with social justice and also with environmental concern? Well, it, it all sounds, you know, very complex, but, but maybe it is more straightforward uh, to say that <coughs> we, we want to live in a union where in every member state, one way or another, there, there is a a minimum wage. It can be established in many different ways, but that we agree that this is this is how we want it here. Uh, and second, uh, that we, of course, uh, help uh, people who work in farming to to change the way they they do their farming to have a sort of a rebalancing with nature, uh, and that the rest of us take upon us as part of our responsibility. Uh, to be able to, to finance that transition. Um, and then I think we can, we can achieve something very precious uh, because we all think live with the hope of, of a healthy uh, produce to eat, but also clean water and, and, and clean air. So I definitely think that it is doable, but of course we have to listen very careful to one another and understand, at least from for my side, 
that when people are reluctant or, or maybe not think the same as I do, it's not because they don't want it, it's because it can be very difficult to see the road to get there. Um, so, so I think in, in these processes where we invest together and recover together, that we listen very carefully to make sure that people do not uh, scare away and say, those, uh, this is too much, we cannot do this, and instead find ways to go there step by step. The topic of uh, social justice is very much about unemployment, poverty, inequalities. There is automation, digitization going on. That means not only innovativeness and development, but also loss of jobs. How can the recovery plan, but also the new multi-annual financial framework, potentially face this challenge? Well, the, the thing is, of course, that when, when new technology and new ways of doing things create new jobs, it's not necessarily uh, the same skills that are needed uh, that the people who, who loses their job may have. Uh, and this is why uh, education is so important. Uh, we, will, we will try to learn uh, from this unprecedented experiment of doing everything digital and then use that to come out with, uh, with a new uh, digital educational action plan for, for our member states to use this to say, okay, a lot of digital skills will be needed. So how can we not only enable young people, but maybe also, also people my age to learn something new to get the next job if the job they have already is disappearing. Um, the second thing is that the, the majority, the main part of, of next generation EU uh, is for member states. And here we say, well, there is an envelope for each member state, but make a plan as to how you would use these funds based on, on uh, uh, the advice when it comes to how to make your economy, your labor market work better, your own plans, your national plans, and of course, your plans for how to fight climate change, uh, how to work with biodiversity, um, how to make these things come together so that when you use these funds, well, you, you think further ahead because we have kind of folded in the Just Transition Fund that was sought for, for instance, coal regions uh, to buffer their transition so the social hardship uh, could be minimized. That has now been folded in in the recovery so that we can do more things at the same time. And at least to me, that makes very good sense because then member states can have, you know, one plan that suits their specific reality instead of having to do things in a patchwork uh, and that may risk of, you know, that things are not well coordinated or it becomes too slow or that people feel that they are left out. Mm -hmm. Ursula von der Leyen introduced a recovery plan for the European Union. The stronger Europe and uh, the next generation EU. What stands behind these statements? Next generation EU means that what we do now is not just to rebuild, it's also to renew. Uh, because we have promised the next generation uh, to fight climate change, uh, to modernize our societies with digital tools, uh, to make the economy work for everyone. This is, these are promises that we have given. And, and by, by doing it under this headline of Next Generation EU, well, we do this for the next generation. And, and the second thing is that I hope that the one thing we, we take from this awful situation of, of the pandemic is that we are stronger together. Not, no individual member state, no individual person or individual family are strong enough to weather something as uh, as big as this, as, as challenging, as, uh, um, as difficult as this. We are stronger together. Um, and this may be <laughs> very trivial, but I also think that it is true. Finally, 
I hope that people from all around the world can watch this interview, but for our Polish audience, what would you say to us Poles at this difficult time of Corona crisis? Well, first and, and, and foremost, uh, what is important for me is that there is a, there's a need for Poland in the European Union. It's not just the other way around, that it's a good thing for Poland to be part of the Union. I think it's also good for, for the Union that Poland is part of the Union. Uh, I do hope that we can, can solve the issue of rule of law because it's such a fundamental one. This is why we have, have, uh, have taken uh, the Polish government uh, to court now several times. Um, but, but for me, the, the most fundamental thing is that also Polish citizens uh, feel and see that they are important uh, for the rest of the Union. Because I really, truly believe this. Poland is a very dynamic society. It's a very dynamic economy. Um, Poland had, you know, unprecedented growth through 30 years. There's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. There's a very strong culture. Uh, and that, of course, is, is very important for the rest of Europe. And, and I think that is, is the basis of which one can develop also when things are tricky and, and well, they are not always easy, but on, on that level and with that respect, I think we can, we can make things better. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Commissioner. No, you're more than welcome. <laughs>